Well, good morning, Lakemont. I pray that this Lord's Day, your time of worship, uh, has been edifying to you, has reminded you of the grace and mercy of your God. Uh, once again, I wish that we could be together, but it is still my great privilege uh, to bring God's word to you. I pray that you have your Bibles with you and open, and there is a sermon outline uh, included with your bulletin, so uh, please follow along. We are continuing our series in 2 Samuel, today looking at David's lament for Saul and Jonathan in verses 17 through 27 in the first chapter. Remember, as we saw last time, David has just learned of their deaths from an otherwise deceitful Amalekite coming from the battle. And he and his men had an immediate reaction of grief, tearing their clothes, mourning, weeping, and fasting until evening when they heard that news. That was back in verses 11 and 12. But now, sometime after the immediate news, David expresses his grief reflectively and thoughtfully in a written out lament in poetic verse. As we look at this section of chapter 1 today, my hope is that we will use this lament of David's to learn how and why to lament our own losses and griefs. As pastor and author Mark Vrogop writes, lament is how you live between the poles of a hard life and trusting in God's sovereignty. Lament is how we bring our sorrow to God. Let me ask you, what sorrows are you bearing right now? What losses are you grieving? In David's lament, we will see that we can come to God with our questions, with our fears, our complaints, and our grief. Lament is not opposed to faith. It is, in fact, faith-driven grief expressed to God. So let's examine David's grief as he reveals it to us and brings it before God in 2 Samuel 1, verses 17 through 27. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. I remind you, this is the word of the Lord. And David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and Jonathan, his son, and he said, it should be taught to the people of Judah. Behold, it is written in the book of Jashar. He said, your glory, O Israel, is slain on your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Publish it not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised exult. You mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew or rain upon you, nor fields of offerings. For there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul not anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan turned not back, and the sword of Saul returned not empty. Saul and Jonathan, beloved and lovely, in life and in death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. You daughters of Israel, weep over Saul who clothed you luxuriously in scarlet, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan lies slain on your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother, Jonathan. Very pleasant have you been to me. Your love to me was extraordinary surpassing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen. 
and the weapons of war perished. God's word, as it's been given to us without error, for our good. Will you pray with me? O Heavenly Father, speak to us now. You are indeed the burden bearer, the great physician. So we pray that you might comfort us in our distresses, enable us to grieve faithfully and yet sincerely. Father, I don't know the burdens of the people who are listening to this, but you do. So would you take your word by your spirit and administer a balm of healing and encouragement to all who hear. Work in us what is pleasing to you, we ask. In Christ's name, amen. I always remember Valentine's Day of 1984. My mother received a call saying that her mother, my grandmother, Grammy, had died. My mother's stunned reaction, the first words out of her mouth were, don't you mean my father? You see, Grammy had always been healthful. She had not been in the hospital since the day my mother was born. Her hugs would crush the skinny little grandson. Grandpa, on the other hand, had been declining. Yet suddenly, at age 15, I lost my first grandparent, and I wasn't sure how to process it. And as many of you know, some of you way better than I do, grief never totally goes away. Every Valentine's Day, I think of Grammy, and I still miss her. There is something missing when we have a loss like that that cannot be completely be filled or replaced in this life. As a pastor, I often remind people who are grieving, who have had losses, that grief is a process. It's ongoing. And one of the weaknesses we have in the modern church is that we've neglected a biblical method, a biblical aid to process our grief. Lament. As American Christians, we often want to move on too quickly. And even as those of us who comfort the grieving, we want them to move on too quickly. But we need to know, and our passage, among many others, tells us, we can both borrow biblical expressions of lament for our own use, or we can even write out our own and turn to God in our grief, in our ongoing grief. Either way, David's lament is instructive for us. First, it teaches us lamenting and remembering. As we look at verses 17 and 18, we see lament is both individual, but it's also corporate. Notice David wrote this not only to express his own grief, but to help the people of Israel, his people, in this catastrophic loss and defeat. Remember, their armies were scattered. Many had died, and their land was occupied by the Philistines. Part of lamenting is remembering. David wrote out this lament, and it tells us it was to be taught to the people of Judah, and it was written in a historical book of record. Some griefs and some losses are too important to be forgotten. Think of how previous generations in our country remembered, remembered the Maine, remembered the Alamo, remembered Pearl Harbor, and more recently in many of our lifetimes, remember 9-11. We call on one another to remember, especially in times of national tragedy. But we also need to remember our personal losses in a healthy way. When a spouse or when a child precedes us in death, the least healthy thing to do is to try and forget. 
the pain will recede. It will fade, but the memory of the loss should be properly remembered. David was saying this catastrophic defeat, this death of the king and his son, the leaders of God's people should be remembered by God's people. Remembering really is an act of faith. We are in remembering refusing to deny the hurt of the pain or the loss. You see, denial is really dishonest. And this lament and the Psalms of lament and the book of Lamentations show us we can be honest with God, before God, with our pain. And we can bring it to him. And we are doing so because we know that God remembers our grief, our pain, and our tears as well. For some reason, in the past few weeks, I've had several opportunities to bring up and share Psalm 56, 8, sometimes with grieving people. David, in that psalm, in the midst of enemies and trials, cries out to God, You have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Do you grasp the beauty of that truth? God records every tear, every loss, each painful grieving. And in that we can know he is for us. He is active and he is not wasting one teardrop of our pain. Don't be afraid to remember. Don't try to deny your grief, but remember it in faith. Take it to the Lord who is working even through your worst days and your most profound losses. Remembering is one of the purposes of lament. But we also see a picture here of David lamenting the robbing of God's glory. Lamenting the robbing of God's glory. I found it interesting in researching and studying this section that even some very solid otherwise biblical commentators act as if this lament is not God-centered, as if it's only personal and national because the Lord is not mentioned directly. But I would argue, and some others do, this is still a God-centered lament. Israel is God's people. Israel is referred to often as God's son. The phrase quoted in the New Testament, out of Egypt I called my son, originally referred to Israel and then applied to Jesus. Their defeats, their fortunes are tied together with the Lord's glory. Their defeats reflect on his glory, even as in their victories, God brings glory to himself. Verse 19 brings out the problem of this defeat. Your glory, O Israel, is slain on your high places. God's chosen king is dead in this battle. And this combined with the repeated expressions of grief and shock and loss. How the mighty have fallen. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. How the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war perished. What is David's concern? He tells us, tell it not in Gath. Publish it not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice lest the daughters of the uncircumcised exult. Gath was the closest Philistine city, Ashkelon the farthest. It's saying, let not all of our enemies rejoice, but they're not just our enemies. This is God-centered grief. Uncircumcised is the key word here. That means these Philistines are outside of God's covenant. They are enemies of his people by definition. So this defeat and these deaths rob God of glory. 
The glory has departed, as it says early in 1 Samuel, Ichabod, meaning the glory has departed, no glory. The Philistines are believing they have shamed the God of Israel. And David can't bear to think of them rejoicing, dancing in the streets, sharing, singing it in their cities and towns that God has been defeated, that his people have been defeated, that his leaders have been killed. He evenly seemingly asked God to curse the very mountain where the battle took place, where the defeat occurred, wanting it in his shame and his lament, wanting it to have no rain, to produce no crops, because the Lord's anointed was not only killed, but defiled there. Derek Thomas describes it like this. David is saying, the glory of God is at stake, and he is grieving. He is grieving. This is a lament. This is a song of sorrow. There's soul in this song. I'm reminded of 1987, when seemingly almost every month, televangelists were being exposed for their sins, for their greed, and for their hypocrisy. Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, caught both in financial greed and excess and moral compromise. Jimmy Swaggart, caught, caught not once, but twice in three years soliciting prostitutes and Oral Roberts insisting that God was extorting him, in effect, by saying God told him he would take his life if $8 million was not raised for his medical school. Now, I was a senior in high school then, not even a Christian yet, and yet I remember the late-night talk show hosts mocking and joking Mocking Christianity, mocking God because of these supposed servants of his. And I wonder if the people of God grieved and lamented. While we can possibly question the genuineness of these televangelist faiths, we cannot deny God's name was mocked because of them. His glory was diminished before men, and David understood this too. Because even with all, all his faults, Saul represented the Lord's kingdom, the Lord's people on earth. Israel's defeat was tied with God's fame. It reminds me of Romans 2.24, where Paul says, The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, because of the sins of the people of God. I think David's lament for the, God's glory before the enemies of God should be instructive for us. Do we lament the state of the church today, the church in the world? Do we genuinely grieve the public deconversions that have become so common lately of former Christian leaders and Christian celebrities and influencers, Rhett and Link, Joshua Harris, Gungor, do we cry out to God in lament when whole denominations take unbiblical positions to try and appease the culture? Do we plead with God to defend and reveal his glory amid the foolishness and failures of much of American Christianity and the many countless ways we do not represent him well before the world? Do we ever grieve? Do you ever grieve because of God's honor? Our faith can never simply be about the benefits we receive from salvation, or even just about our church. Our faith is a relationship with the God who is over all of his people throughout the world. And we should hurt when the one we love is defamed, when his glory is, defined, is denied, and his church is disgraced before men. Think of Jesus weeping over Jerusalem, even as he was on his way to the cross. And so the Christian, 
not only grieves for individual losses, but for kingdom losses and for the blaspheming of God's name before the world. We should grieve. We should lament. That is God-centered grief. Similarly, we also see David lamenting the loss of God-given leaders. Beginning in verse 22, David rightly does not focus on Saul's failings or on Saul's many attempts to kill David. Instead, he mourns and cries out again because the God-given king, the anointed of the Lord, has been killed. In fact, the two greatest military leaders other than David of God's nation have been defeated and killed in one battle. And so David rightly remembers their courage in battle and their victories in verse 22. Remember, Saul liberated Jabesh Gilead from the Ammonites in 1 Samuel 11. A great victory. Jonathan and his armor bearer alone were used by God to bring about a great defeat of the Philistines in 1 Samuel 14. Saul's sword and Jonathan's bow had killed many of the Lord's enemies in battle. Verse 23 shows, highlights Jonathan's character as a public figure. Despite everything, Jonathan remained with his father, loyal to his father, loyal to the king, loyal to the kingdom even to the end. And Saul, for all his failings, never completely rejected his son and was with him at the end. David remembers their swiftness and victory and their might, comparing them to eagles and lions. He remembers how during much of Saul's long reign, of which we only saw snapshots through time, there was prosperity. Verse 24, and so David, in contrast to saying he doesn't want the Philistines, the daughters of the Philistines rejoicing, he does want the daughters of Israel to weep, to weep over the loss. And again, we hear that plaintive cry, how the mighty have fallen. This is really grief mixed with gratitude. As it looks back, as it remembers, it's thankful. But that also magnifies the loss. There's a clear understanding and grieving for what has been lost. These were not only individual deaths, but great losses for the people of God, for the Lord's earthly kingdom. And they should lament. It makes sense. After all, we grieve as a country when a president is killed in office. Lincoln or Kennedy come to mind. Even political enemies in those times recognize the loss to the nation when a leader is killed or suddenly dies. Not because we agree with them, but because they represent our country. They lead our country, and so we lament. Similarly, we should grieve the losses to God's kingdom when we lose effective leaders of God's kingdom. When Billy Graham died, or R.C. Sproul, it was appropriate for us to grieve, to remember, to lament their loss. When our own Pastor Jack died. I know that Lakemont grieved not only the man and your relationships with him, but also the loss of a pastor to a church, an effective evangelist, a witness in the community. I remember him as an effective leader in our regional church, the Presbytery. And so it is right to grieve when the Lord takes a leader like that away. And it is even right and appropriate to wrestle before God with it and ask why. If the psalmist could ask why, if the psalmist could cry out, how long, O Lord, does that, does that not tell us that we in faith and with faith should follow their examples? Well, finally, we go from the corporate to the personal, from national loss to individual grief, lamenting the loss of a faithful friend, beginning in the middle of verse 25. This is the most personal part of the lament. David's friend, closest friend, the one who loved him with a selfless love, a faithful friend who had sacrificed and willingly renounced 
his own claim to the kingship because he knew David was the Lord's anointed and the Lord's choice. And Jonathan's love for David here is the Hebrew word hesed, loving kindness, faithfulness, which is so often used in the Old Testament of God's love and grace and mercy to us. This had been a true friend. Remember 1 Samuel 18, verse 1. The soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. No wonder David refers to him here as my brother, Jonathan, and proclaims how extraordinary his love was, how it surpassed even the love of women. As a side note, and as an apologetic, this verse has often been used to wrongly suggest some kind of same-sex attraction or worse. But that is reading our culture into the text. It's not found there. In that culture, something like that would never be expressed in a public lament because it was shameful. It's a sad reflection, too, that we consider that. And on the flip side, that we as men have such an impoverished view of deep, loving male friendships that we would be embarrassed to say something like that. And yet the friendship of David and Jonathan was a model. And so for David, this was a crushing loss. Matthew Henry wrote of David here, the more we love, the more we grieve. And I'm sure most of you can say amen to that. This section of the lament is probably the easiest for us to relate to. Anyone who has lost someone close to them, someone dear, can understand David's pain and his crying out. It is not wrong to grieve, but we do not want to grieve wrongly. In this kind of grief, rightly expressed, we look to the Savior, the one who himself is described as a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Isaiah 53, 3. Jesus wept over Lazarus, personal loss, even though he would raise him moments later, John eleven thirty five. 35. Richard Phillips rightly explains, in this ministry of sympathy, David points our grieving and our hurting hearts to Jesus Christ, whom David typifies, and whose compassion, love, and sorrow for the hurts of this world enable us to connect with the heart of God. This is our true need amid the grief of this world, to know and feel the fatherly love of our maker in heaven. We are blessed to read in Psalm 34, 18, that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. Phillips continues, but in the life, ministry, and suffering of God's son, Jesus, who came into this world and joined himself to our flesh, our hearts actually touch the heart of God. And his love ministers a salvation that penetrates to the deepest needs of our souls. End quote. You see, brothers and sisters, that is what we need to be seeking in our grief. That is why and how we use our laments. The losses we experience of this kind are real and painful and seemingly unbearable. But the heart of the Lord bears them with us and enables us to persevere even in the midst of them. Is that where you go with your grief? In your pain, do you run to the Lord who is near to you, who was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and who bore our burdens and our sins? Do you run to him, or do you push him away in bitterness of soul? In his book on lament that I already referenced, Mark Rogop looks at Lamentations 3, where it is said of the Lord, his mercies never come 
to an end. Verse 22. Rogop then writes, God supplies the mercy and grace we need every day. We endure because divine mercy is never exhausted. That's a promise we must believe. He continues, when God strips you of everything and all you have is him, you have enough. Therefore, lament can awaken you to the truth of God's hesed. There's that word again. It can remind you that God is everything you really need. End quote. Brothers and sisters, some of you may be carrying heavy burdens and great losses even this day. Faith in Jesus Christ does not mean we will not face pain. In fact, our Savior promised we would. It does not prevent us from enduring agonizing losses in this fallen world. But it does mean we are never alone. We are never unsupplied with what we need. And the Lord remembers our tears, our cries, and yes, our laments. We have a high priest the Lord Jesus Christ, who has borne our sin, not only our sins, but also our griefs, our pains, and our sorrows. So Christian, in your pain, will you move toward him in faith, even if it's crawling, inch by inch, day by day? Will you remember his suffering and his death for you as an unshakable reminder of his love, even when your losses and your circumstances scream to you otherwise? Scream to you that God is not enough, that he does not love you, and he couldn't have let this happen. Do you remember the cross? And do you remember that your tears are remembered? Your Savior sympathizes with your weaknesses and supplies everything that he knows that you need. Ultimately, David's lament drives us by necessity to David's greater son and to David's heavenly father. God the Father, God the Son and the Spirit who enables us to cry out even when we don't have the words. Will you follow David and take your griefs to the only one who can bear them for you, to the only one who truly loves you, and to the only one who truly knows the depths of your loss and your grief and your need? Let's go to him now. Well, Father God, we thank you now that even amidst our pain, and even when we seek to push you away, you are always for us because of Jesus. And since you say you did not spare your own son, since we know it, you do also give us all things. Your grace and your mercy are ever new and always needed. Be with those enduring great grief and sorrow today. Enable them to grieve well, to learn to lament in faith, and to learn to cling to enduring hope because of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.